Hello and welcome to the Fresh Air Sci-Fi Show. I'm Joe. I'm Dave. I'm Luke. I'm Chesh. <laughs> I'm Philip. See, what hell, Chesh? I mean, BCP. I mean, <laughs> you're a heretic. <laughs> Oh, oh, I was going on the L as well. <laughs> I don't. I'm not used to the pseudonym yet. Oh. Uh, and to be Wait, honest, I, not... I think we should just leave that in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If, if we're going by alphabetical real life names, I'm going last. <laughs> what is it? Victoria. Oh, uh, you oh. definitely. Will. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm bearded bearded heretic. <laughs> I'm bearded heretic. Welcome to AA. <laughs> uh, and so, uh, is this, recently... is this is atheist anonymous. <laughs> <laughs> um, recently, um, we had a, a conversation on the end of month free for all about free will and determinism and it's inspired conversations in our facebook group and on our discord um and we figured we'd facilitate a conversation um where i'm not quite as drunk (laughs) 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 last for me (laughs) um and just go through a few of the the basics of free will and you know different definitions of free will and our opinions on all of them um so i suppose the first thing we really need to cover off is different types or definitions of free will um so we'll go through each one and give our give our opinion on it so one of the the main free will you hear people discussing um is known as libertarian free will or non-causal free will um and generally i mean how how do we describe that one um you can read out a little quote on it actually uh, proponents of non-causal accounts generally hold that each intentional action is or begins with a basic mental action a decision or a choice is commonly said to be a basic action an overt bodily action, such as raising one's arm, is held to be a non-basic complex action that is constituted by a basic mental actions bringing about a certain motion of one's body. The basic action in this case is often called a volition, which is said to be the agent's willing, trying or endeavouring to move certain part of her body in a certain way. Um, so another point of it is it, it it goes that there's no it's not causally determined, right? There is nothing that's caused them to to do this action, and I think that I think every single one of us would actually struggle imagining there being absolutely no cause for an action. I'm going to open that up to the floor and chime in. Yeah, I would agree until you get to like quantum mechanics. I would agree with yeah. chat. <laughs> yeah, so when you get really, really small or really, really big, but from like already a complex structure, if you're starting from that point, if you already have a complex structure in existence, then yeah, I imagine that you would have a, have a you'd have a hard time with that. Certainly, in terms of humans, uh, yeah, I would agree. Libertarian free will is uh, not possible. Yeah, I I would agree as well. I think. Well, actually, no, no. I agree. <laughs> it's it's one of those guy with the actual PhD is going to come in and shit on all of us. <laughs> Not quite PhD yet, but working yeah. on it. <laughs> Pre PhD. Uh, yeah, I mean, I yeah. think that that is the thing that there is always some causal factor it, it within it. You know, if even if it's I'm going to go to the fridge and get some food. 
Right. Time is an illusion. You already have your PhD for anybody watching this in the future. <laughs> <laughs> well, if I forget to upload it, all that moments may well be the case. simultaneously. <laughs> <laughs> <Easy> um, wrist. <laughs> <laughs> But if we think about it, you know, that, that there is always some form of causal action. You know, we, we feel hungry, so we decide to go to the fridge and, and look for food. And some people might go, yeah, well, I can refuse to go to the fridge and look for food. But again, why are you refusing to go? Uh, there's always going to be some reasoning there, some cause for you to do or not do the action. And I think that that is one of the things with, with non-causal free will that seem to show it incredibly weak um at least not in its purest form i know there are some people uh i mean dave you might be able to jump in on this one that make uh amendments to libertarian free will um i think most of us have uh have laid in bed at some point having to pee but not wanting to get out of bed. <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> Um, one of the modifications to libertarian free will is just the ability to do otherwise. Yeah. Oh. So, yeah. So if you rewound, ta rewound time, you could go and choose a different course of action. I think that there's actually some situations where it's hard to imagine that you even could. Um, just because yeah, that there yeah, were definitely. other choices doesn't mean if you were to rewind time, you would, because you could only ever make decisions based on the previous things that have been going on and the information that you had at the time so why would you ever change your mind i think would be the question yeah yeah actually that that comes on to the next definition of, of free will that i was going to bring up which is the freedom to do otherwise um and one of the problems i have with this definition personally is it sounds like it's talking about action more than will you know, I mean, if, if we're talking about will, to me, will is talking about something from from within. We're willing something to happen. There are times when we might actually will something different to happen, but we're caught in a situation because there has been an imposition on our bodies or something like that. So we're still willing something else, but we don't have the freedom to do otherwise in the situation. Well, it's not like humans always behave in the way that's most conducive for whatever they want. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Um, so I think that's one of the well, biggest in issues. that situation. Sorry, in that situation, you you know, you were saying it doesn't sound like will. What will means is like the desire to bring something about. So choosing a different action is the desire to bring about a different course of action. It, exactly. So it's not necessarily being able to do it, though, is it? Um, yeah, you could want to be able to no. play a concerto on the piano. That doesn't mean you're capable of doing so. But then yeah. again, you can always take, yeah. choose to take the steps to learn it. But I think you could also modify it just simply to say, like, the ability to will otherwise or something like that, and you wouldn't have the yeah. objection. And I think actually this is this is the interesting point right? because I don't I don't know if we all if we would all agree with you, um, <laughs> doggy. Like, oh, oh, that's me. <laughs> Did he I have the freedom to do you. otherwise? <laughs> did Doc have the freedom to not eat a cheesy poof? I don't think he did. <laughs> I think he's compelled. Yeah. yeah. But, but I think we, like, we would disagree on, like, here, at least from, from what I've seen you say. Uh, Luke, or be it heretic, I don't know what to call you now. Let's <laughs> <laughs> call everyone okay. Dave. Because, like, <laughs> you know, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if, like, would you agree that we have free will if this was the definition? Like, the ability to will otherwise. Do you think that we have the ability to will otherwise for a, a, every, any given situation? Could you give me a situation so I can make that more concrete? Uh, I don't know. Like, <laughs> let's take the, like, eating it chip example or something like that or listen to a piece of music like you like you said in your example like do you think oh right so you have the ability to yeah. choose a different uh song to be played or a different album or artist or whatever 
So I think I think my example was I have the ability to put on One Direction, and I could do that, but I wouldn't because I don't like One Direction, right? Yeah. I I, I, I agree with that. Yeah, I think that we I think for me it's 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 not necessarily about what we would do, but what we could do. I think oh, for me that, that's the difference. From a theist perspective, I've kind of noticed a sort of an analogy of what's your favorite color. If I ask you and I already know the answer, does that mean you don't have the freedom to choose a different color, even though I know what you're going to say because I already know what your color is? So, could could are you saying could we choose a different color to be our favorite color? Yes. So you, if you have a favorite color and I already know what your favorite color is, and I ask you, you're free to answer however you want. You're also free to change your mind instantaneously if you so choose. But I already know the answer, and I know the answer you're going to give. So that's the answer you're going to give. Yeah. So this is, I guess, this is this is what I've kind of trying to be trying to be thinking about over the past couple of days. Is um, I think there's a there's a heavy kind of thing about free will. In that, if it's predictable, then how can it be free will? Yeah. So if I can predict somebody's behavior, and have do they have the, the will to be able to change their behavior? And I I don't necessarily think the predictability uh, excludes free will. I think I think I think it's about like yeah, I would agree I, with that. you know I, I you know psychology is predicated on predictability. The whole point of it is that we can predict people's behaviors and we can you come up with creatures of habit. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, but, but could people make different decisions? Yes. I think in, in a lot I don't of cases, know. Yeah, not in all cases. That, that I think is where people get hung up. I think people see it as an all or nothing situation when I think it's like kind of more of a spectrum. Mm. I don't know how you could possibly have a society where humans are able to interact with each other on a social level without having a degree of predictability or at least a degree of, of taught behaviors. So if I teach somebody to behave in a specific way and that we go to the situation where they ought to behave that way, that you can train somebody to change their behavior, right? So take, for example, somebody who is on air playing a character. When they're on air, they're doing those behaviors. They've taught, they've been taught, or they've taught themselves to behave this way in front of a camera. Or you've been taught to behave with these particular um, rules or, yeah. or manners. If you're in this situation, like if you're at a funeral, you're not behaving the same way you do at a frat party, unless it's a very particular kind of funeral or a very particular kind of <laughs> frat party. So. It's it's there there are taught and learned behaviors that you will it's predictable that you will behave in that way because you've either been taught to or because we're social and how could you possibly be able to communicate with somebody when there is no predictability there? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And there, there are situations where we where we literally do not have free will. And I think um, Free Vikings gave a really good example about holding our breath until we die. Yeah, we can't do that because our brain uh, knocks us out in order to restart our breath to prevent us from dying. It's literally like designed that way. And and I, when I had that thought, I don't you guys were in the comment, but I, I was like, the only reason that the brain would be able to do that is because there were people who tried it and <laughs> and succeeded and they died. <laughs> that's natural the selection. Reason. Exactly. Yeah, that's the only reason why that would be a function of the brain. <laughs> so obviously, at some point, there was somebody who was able to hold their breath until they died, yeah. and they died, <laughs> and then their genes would get passed on. I'd be curious to know if you would be able to train yourself, because like the mind is a powerful thing, and so the mind can overpower itself. You can you can think you know something and basically think yourself out of that thing if you really want to. You can trick your brain to do all kinds of things if you have the dedication to just beat it into yourself. So I wonder if you could actually bypass that if you, you would have to train for it, though. It's not something you would just be able to do. It would be like, no, 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 I am going to keep doing this until I succeed because that's how humans are. We just brute force things. <laughs> There are those people that have trained themselves to hold their breath underwater for like four minutes or something crazy like that, aren't there? Four minutes. 
I think David, something David, like Blaine, that. David Blaine <laughs> did it for 20. <laughs> 20 did he minutes. really? <laughs> David Blaine's ridiculous. He's a ridiculous human because his <laughs> his his philosophy of magic is: if I can do it for real, I will. <laughs> so he's loads, loads of stupid things, actually for real. The longest breath hold was a fr German free diver in 2012 named Tom, who held his breath underwater for 22 minutes and 22 seconds. He, he well done, he, Tom. He beat David. David Blaine got the record, and then like a year later, this guy got the record. No, no, no. There was somebody. There was another guy named Dane before Blaine. Dane did it for twenty. Uh, beat the record at twenty-two minutes. So Blaine did it at twenty. Then Dane did it at twenty-two minutes, and and then this guy did it for twenty-two minutes and twenty-two seconds. Because <laughs> he's That's an animal. Tom's kind of a dick. <laughs> oh, there you go. That's even longer than I realized. So, yeah, you can train your body to do some crazy things. Yeah, the funny thing is that, like, if someone attempts to train his body to, to okay, basically, he'll never realize that when he succeeds. <laughs> listen, listen, you die for your cause. <laughs> <laughs> it's about the principle of the matter. <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense. Anyway, like I think um, it is expected, sort of like uh, of me here. Like I think I'm going to defend um, like strict determinism, or at least um, like determinism mixed with with randomness. But but like I, I would hold the view. I think at least I find it at the moment more likely than 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 none. Like that, that it's really not a spectrum. Like I, I guess that you you could say that. Within within what I'm going to talk about, you know, there are different stages, but they don't really make, at the end of the day, a difference in the sense that I believe that um, that there is no like there is no real free will, right? There is no ability to choose otherwise in in any scenario, not even in the ones that you would you would say that uh, there is the ability to do otherwise, right? I guess. And um, like as as probably as I argued yesterday, I still, I still think that this is the best way to, to do so. I think that pretty much every action or or one that you have can be explained almost entirely, actually entirely, by a combination of sort of like a competing desires thing, right? Where um, like whatever you're gonna end up doing is is basically what, what you want more. To, to do um, see I, I agree with that entirely i'm i'm also in that camp of you know what the, the every whatever initial cause you want to grant all of that is such <laughs> like a chain reaction to more causes more events more causes more events more causes more events that you have no choice but to be here watching you have no choice but to be even if you could have chosen not to you you never would have and, yeah, basically. But it's so complicated, and the web of cause and reaction is so beyond what we could compute that it may as well be free will as far as we're concerned. Because who? <laughs> yeah, it, it definitely seems like like it is. But I think, yeah, um, it's for, funny even even for those choices about music, like you say, okay, okay, like why would I, why would I choose to hear a different song, right? And and if I really wanted to, I could I could pick something I could pick something different that I don't that I don't want to listen to. But, but well, you I could guess, even pick something you didn't like. But the thing yeah. was, is you're still doing that for a reason. Yeah, and there was still exactly. a cause for that reason, and there was still cause for that yeah, reason. Yeah, that's that's what I mean, right? You could you could explain it by saying, okay, you have this other desire that is like to prove that you have free will or something. The best yeah. way to do that is to go against what you would want in that situation. So that, that desire rises. And, and overrides the other desire, which would naturally lead, to, lead you to choose the song that you would want to listen to. And of course, there's another component to this because at some point, as I mentioned yesterday, you know, you get to, to a scenario where um, it's not really about your wants anymore. It's about you know calculating you know what is the best path forward. I think yesterday I gave, gave the example of, of like constructing a house. You know, you, you get you get to like maybe you want to to build a house. Uh, but at some point, you know, it's not it's not wants that drive your desires. It's it's about you know what is the best way to do a certain thing. 
right? What is yeah. the best way to lay a foundation of the house or something like that? Which is one of my favorite things about humans because we almost never pick the right one. <laughs> that's, that's, almost, yeah. Like, yeah, pretty much. But also, like, just to finish, and then and then uh, like, um, the, the whole idea would be then that there is some some something like I think and. Uh, they can correct me here. I think it would be called doxastic invol involuntarism or something like that. Inability to choose your belief. Yeah, exactly. It's 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 the idea that you cannot choose what you believe, and so you you wouldn't you know really choose you know what you find the best the best way to proceed. Like you could influence yourself by by checking these other builders, you know. But even that would be you know the desire to drive that to to be as informed as possible. So even that would would be out of your control. You know, I think people can choose a belief to a degree like you there is such a thing as self-delusion you can lie to yourself you can convince yourself of things that you know aren't the case and we've seen this before historically but there's still a reason why you're doing that which is the cause for why you're doing that which is still deterministic <laughs> yeah i yeah I, i'm not like i I'm, i'd have to think about that i don't i don't, I don't know if i would agree with the idea that they, what, they, watch Kyle on the stream I just did. <laughs> you want to see delusion in action? Yeah, I mean, you, you can definitely <laughs> try to sort of like you, you have such a desire to be right that it sort of overrides what you would usually do to, to get to sort of yeah. a more balanced conclusion. So you sort of exclude, you don't even listen because you're too afraid to. To, yeah, you to, can't to deal, or side. you can't yeah. you can't deal with reality. You like you you can't accept what's happened, and so your brain just goes into overdrive one way or another, and so you end up in like as this is this happens with trauma victims. Uh, somebody who's a victim of trauma may override a memory. Some good they could have watched this thing happen, but they they can't handle it, so their brain overrides it and pretends it never happened and so you there's there's even involuntary situations where your brain has just decided you know <laughs> yeah and i guess i guess i guess the the you know i subconscious i think uh has a big part to play in in that area uh especially around protecting like subconscious is is our our psychological defense mechanism essentially in a lot of areas and, and helps us to make arbitrary decisions which is you know these uh i don't even know how to say the word libet 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 see i i don't know that but no, the I don't, we did a like, we did a podcast on free will and i called it libet the entire thing and then <laughs> suddenly i listened back and i heard dave say it as libet and i went oh my god why didn't i pick up on that yeah these, <laughs> yeah right so there's there's i i think that started in the 1980s and all the way up until today they're still only uh doing it for arbitrary decisions and they haven't they have not done any studies or any research into complex choices that require uh conscious processing unfortunately a lot of our studies of the human psyche got shut down around in the 60s and 70s when they were like mm, that's kind of torture maybe don't do that to people <laughs> yeah. Yeah. i guess i guess um just in terms of the uh, the stuff around having a framework around us that that limits our free will, and I think that you're right, Philip, in saying that you know there are there is there is stuff there like our subconscious, like uh, society, our culture, the way we're brought up. All of these elements do limit our free will to a certain extent. Um, I guess uh, an analogy. That I've thought of is do you regard yourself as a free person? Like, do you see yourself within the right society? Right. Are yeah, you I, I, yeah, I would say so. Yes, but there's a framework there that restricts you. There's laws. There's there's social etiquette. There's all this stuff, but you wouldn't you wouldn't Those... say that you weren't free. Right. Yeah. Actually, what you've said well, there is there's the a difference there though. The last definition of free will, because I, I wanted us to get those out before mm. we got. Yeah. Get them out. Much into the meat. So, I mean, there, I know there's another yeah. couple that we. Sorry, just say quickly. Within that framework, though, you can still choose to not follow that law. Now, there may be consequences. You wouldn't be free from, say, consequences. You, 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 you might have to live on the run if you don't want to be incarcerated, etc. <laughs> Are you talking about but that? You can. <laughs> you can still choose to or to not 
follow those things. So you you're not in bondage. You're you're free as in you aren't aren't restrained physically or there's no necessarily mental constraints that are being put on you as like say us in a slave owner situation, but you still have to go to work. Right. But you get to choose what job you have. So there's still choices within that framework and you could still choose not to work at all if you want. They're just we live in a society. <laughs> So, I mean, that, that sort of ties into, I mean, there's probably another couple of, of definitions of free will, but these are sort of the main ones that pop out to, that explain key differences. Um, and it's, it's the ability to reflect on your mental states, knowledge and experience and make a decision, like consciously make a decision. And there are some that would say that, you know, your, your mental states, knowledge, experience, etc., cetera, are all causal factors in your final choice so your your choice actually isn't free um and if you're speaking about comparing it to libertarian free will i'd say you're definitely right in that regard because libertarian free will is saying there is no causal factor in, in that regard this is just a different take of it this to me is working within the confines of um the system that we have that, you know, the you way... are a physical being. You're not going to be breaking physics anytime soon. Exactly. Um, so I suppose what we need to cover off is actually how you all see mental states. So I'm, I know we, we say the brain is a physical thing, and I think we'd all agree that the brain is a physical thing. Would you say mental states are wholly physical? Ooh. Yeah, I think they have to be. Uh, well, <clears throat> sorry. Oh. <laughs> I think I think our experience of mental states isn't entirely physical because like the thoughts we have, the words we hear in our head, they come from physical processes, but we hear them. We 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 have a uh, uh, an experience that is is separate from the physical. So in that um, you know, Trying to think of like, like that word doesn't exist. So if you think of the word thought and you you hear it in your head, that word doesn't exist. It's your brain. It's your brain process firing off. It's an interpretation it's of sound waves. Yeah, uh, so, that, so that, that pose an idea. Yeah. So so I think I think uh, we we've had this discussion, with Dave and Joe. Like it's an emergent property, but like so the the, the experience of our thoughts and our mental states is emergent from the physical processes. You two down the bottom I, on the way in on that as well? The ontological grounding is but the actual mental state is phenomenological. Sure, yeah, yeah. Or in some big way. Yeah, because I like there's a big difference between how you have to experience these states, which is physical, but the states themselves are sort of nebulous in in having a they don't have a physical state. Yeah, yeah, I would agree with that. What about you? Yeah, Philip? I think. Yeah, I think I think I would agree. Like, I think um, I'm not, I'm actually not necessarily set on any particular theory of mind yet. I think that like. How the problem of consciousness and all of that is a bit. I, I try to wrap my head around it, and but but in general, I would I would agree. I think yes. So if we say that the mental states are not wholly physical, even though they are influenced by physical, and let's just assume that in general, right, the the universe is deterministic. It's it's mostly deterministic anyway because it's. A little bit probabilistic, but that doesn't really change anything. So we'll just say it's pretty much all the way deterministic. Yet our mental states are not fully physical. Does that mean that psychological determinism or physical determinism entails psychological determinism? I think that you have to experience life through physical means. You don't have any other choice. And so even if something that you're experiencing is metaphysical, then it, 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 it doesn't entirely matter to your experience still 
needing to be physical. So any cause and reaction and choice, although could be determined by metaphysical things, because they still have to be viewed and processed through a physical existence or a physical experience, it has to be. Yeah, I would agree that. Like, I think if you're a physicalist and you think that like the mind emerges for, from matter, then it's it's not possible for there to be like you you you're pretty much committed, I think, to the idea that that whatever physical hap that is happening that is causing you to have this this view of mental state that that, that is if that is the determination of it, if that itself is deterministic or or random, then, then I think that sort of kills. My understanding. An example. Idea. An example might be uh, what's um, being outraged. Uh, you choose to be outraged. That's that's a choice you make. You thought you hear something that makes you uncomfortable. You hear something that's like I don't like that, and then you choose to respond to it. And if outrage is the choice that you've made, you, you don't have to be. You can be like being offended. You choose to be offended. So, like, you can hear something that you don't like or hear something that makes you angry, but you choose to go out of your way. No, no, that offends me. Me. That that bothers me personally. And you choose. You could choose not to be. You could be like, you know what? Today, I'm not dealing with that. I'm not going to be offended by this today. I'm going to go off and I'm going to handle it this way. But you're still making you're making a choice due to, like an, like, like, an outside factor that may or may not be physical. Can I ask a question before I give my view? No. Hey, I don't, <laughs> I don't, do you have the will to? Do you have the will to? I, I dare brilliant. you. Brilliant. Um, Abel Joe, can you describe compatibilism to me? There's various forms of compatibilism. Um, and one I agree with most. Describe that one. <laughs> <laughs> Compatibilism is basically the idea that while well, we live in a deterministic universe, there is some aspect to our brain and our mental states that allows us to make limited choices. So that's that's my view of it, I guess. I think uh, um, we do have the ability to make limited, and I use the word limited because I do think there is a limit to it, um, decisions that are uh, active and um, I don't know what the word is. Yeah, like we we have agency in that in that situation. Do you think that? Well, we all agreed that that yeah. human beings are creatures of habit, right? Can you break a habit? Yeah. Well, yeah, of course you can. So you're basically taking something that is second nature to you or taking something that's sort of like is more of a subconscious choice rather than a conscious choice. And you're making a conscious decision to make a change to what you unconsciously are doing. So you, your consciousness can override your subconsciousness and vice versa, depending on the situation. Right. So like you're consciously choosing not to breathe, but your subconscious is like, nah, bruh. <laughs> no, 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 I disagree okay. with this. I very much disagree with this decision you're making right now. Right. And it goes and so the other way too. It goes the other way. So if you're uh, addicted to smoking, or if you have a subconscious, uh, oh, that offends me. No, I'm going to choose to not be offended. Things like that. Yeah, yeah. I mean that, that, that's one of the things that the the Stroop effect, which is really, really, really simple, um, shows you that you know you you have your your unconscious mind putting a thought there, and your conscious mind goes, "No, that's not the answer," and it overrides it. And yeah. you can see this sort of thing, and you can see this happening all the time. You can have all these unconscious desires coming, and I understand the argument for de from desire in all of these things. You'll have your unconscious desire, and then you'll have a conscious desire that goes, "Well, no, my essentially my conscious desire is big for that, bigger than that." And I, I'd agree. I don't think we can necessarily control can control our desires, but what we can control is how we act on those desires. And I think behavior. That, yeah. That's my that's my view. So I, 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 I would that, disagree with that. Just I think <laughs> <laughs> I, our, conscious, our conscious thought processes allow us to, and and I guess this is where my head's at. We have the ability to reason. We have the ability to make rational decisions 
as opposed to ones that would benefit us, benefit us uh, like in the short term, for instance. So, so we can make a choice based on information external to us and, and information from quite abstract uh, areas. And to me, uh, being able to rationalize and being able to change our thought processes through consciousness demonstrates that we have uh, a level of agency. Well, you're cutting out there a second, Luke. Yeah, okay. I was just about to ask if it's only me that... No, 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 you, you just started cutting out. I get yeah. now? Yeah. It sounded like you went through a tunnel. Yeah. <laughs> Weird. That's bizarre. It's a bit better, yes, for me at least. It's better. Oh, that's okay. I don't, I don't remember what I was saying. You were saying that you have agency, or the fact that we have agency lends to... What? And rational thoughts. Yeah, That's yeah, what's right. happening actually, Chesh. I don't know what it is. There's actually some air coming through from your end, and it was dubbing him out. That's that's uh-huh. what was happening. But <laughs> I was muted. <laughs> yeah, when you muted, it suddenly he came back and started talking normally. Oh, oh uh, <laughs> apparently it's all my fault. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I see how well, it is. Sorry, you I had no choice in the matter, so don't worry. You're <laughs> not to blame. <laughs> so I guess, I guess, yeah. The thought is that um, you know, uh, if if we have like an impulse or we have a a, 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 um, a motivation. So for instance, you know, like uh, I am um, really angry at Philip for disagreeing with me, so I want to punch him in the face. <laughs> then I rationalize the fact that actually Philip's quite a nice guy. Uh, this is only a small thing, really. Punching him in the face isn't really that feasible right now. And... Uh, it probably wouldn't be good if I did that anyway. To me, that that shows that we we because we can make informed decisions, we are uh, able to 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 alter our will and alter our like kind of uh, um like outcomes based on information through rationality, and that indicates to me that there's some element of free will there. If that made any sense. <laughs> yeah, it, it makes sense. Like, I think I don't want to make this, like, I, I agree. Like, I can observe these things uh, phenomenologically. I get, like, I, I can see that in my mind, right, what you're talking about. I can understand, for example, that I, like, I might have some impulse and then I, I start thinking about it and then I pick, like, this thought from there and then that other thing. And then, like, I can, I can sympathize with the, experience of it the, what i would call the experience of, of, of free will and and i see it as well but i don't i don't think that there is like anything really there that is making you uh, free to choose one of these things right i think that even though it is like, like you experience it I, I think that is just it basically you, you you're almost like watching a movie play out where you feel like you're the first person character and so you 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 see all of these things happening inside of you but i don't think there is actually any point in there where you would be able to actually do one thing over the other like from like i don't even know how i would how that would be described because what what would be making that decision in fact like this is a question that i wanted to uh, that i had for you joe um like when you said that you have these base desires, right? You had you have these base desires, but then you can choose to act upon them. And and my my question is, what what is the thing that is making you, like what is what is determining the switch between you know whether or not you're gonna act on the, the, the desire or not? Like, like that, like if if you say that it can't, uh, that it is um, caused, right? Presumably you would like, because you said that free will. Um, is causal at least according to you like my, my question would be what is the thing that is making you know you say okay i will act on this or i won't act on this that, that would be my question and i i don't have an answer to that and, and this is I, I actually i have an answer it but, but it's not I, what you would probably want to hear i think but no, well, no, I think it would come down to struggle with the, the arguments from desires because i don't actually have a good answer for that I, I agree with the desires part, right? So you say I've got the impulse, right? And I choose not to act on that impulse. And that's probably because I've decided that I don't want to be impulsive, right? I've got a bigger desire to not be impulsive. Or 
I realize that this impulse is bad. It's not good for me to act on this impulse or or whatever. But I rationalize my way through it and I think about it. And I think all this deliberation that goes on is what we're talking about. I'm reflecting on my mental states. I'm reflecting on my desires. I'm reflecting on my knowledge and my experience. And I'm making a conscious decision. Well, you have a whole nother set though too, right? Because we're more than the sum of our parts. So the reason that you may, like what we consider reason and rationale isn't necessary. Like there's more to what causes that to even happen, right? So you've got like this cell need has one drive. It does this thing. This other cell has to interact with it. And so they have to work together to be able to perform this function. But they both have the single desire of this desire of this one thing, right? And so even though those things are different, they come together to be able to form something bigger. And so the same thing kind of goes with like individuals within a society. I have a drive to do this. You have a drive to do that. If we work together, we are more likely to reach our goal, right? But if you're talking about whether or not you have free will in to my conscious decision to override my subconscious or vice versa, there's still deterministic factors in making that decision. So if you have a habit of um, flicking your hair, uh, when I get I flick my hair, can you stop that? Yeah. If you make a conscious decision to be like, no, nope, nope, don't do it. You start reaching, nope, you stop yourself. But there's deterministic factors as to why you might be doing that. Maybe it's because I want to be a better liar. And when I lie and get uncomfortable and nervous, I flick my hair. Well, I want to be better at lying. So I don't want to, I want to be good at poker. So I'm going to stop trying to do that. So there's still deterministic factors as to why your, con- your conscious mm-hmm. might override your subconscious and vice versa. This is why I think it's such like, it's such an interconnected web because it's not even just a, your habits and your way of thinking and your biology wasn't chosen by you. You didn't make that decision. You had no part of that whatsoever. You're just stuck with what you got, brother. <laughs> you might be able to go out of, out of your way to make changes. You might be able to go out of your way to learn and practice to be better at something or worse than something, but you're still stuck with your base stats. You, those are just what they are. Yeah. Are you? I, I, guess, I guess with like the, the way that I have looked at this over the past like week or so is um i think a lot of the discussion is about past decisions and about things we can't change and and that gives the 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 kind of presentation that that things will always uh, happen no matter what because things have always happened no matter what yeah i guess i guess my view is and this is a question do you guys think that uh People could have the ability to change uh, their futures, essentially. Or do you think that those futures are just going to play out exactly how things roll? Because my view is that uh, there is uh, a, a large, a large part of it is, um, you know, that there's things that happen to people in their lives that do make it so that you know, like like the socioeconomic status that they're born into and stuff like that, that will influence their lives going forwards. Um, I do also think that that people can make uh, active choices in their lives that will change their futures at some point, and I guess that that is part of the premise of uh, something like stoicism. You know, and and you know, you you can control what you can control, and you can't control what you can't control, and therefore you need to uh, to balance that and to to kind of focus on the stuff you can control, and not worry so much about stuff you can't control. I think that. Uh, see, this is, I think, I don't know if me and Phil are on the same page. We might be. I think we might be. And yeah. it's that if so, like you can predict what somebody's going to, what somebody's life is going to be like based on how they're currently behaving and how they have behaved. If they decide to make a change to their behavior, then that outcome will change still predictably to whatever change that is, even if it seems to be something random to us. It's not really random because it's just something we couldn't account for because we don't have that information. But whatever caused that person to decide to change their behavior was something that was already going to happen anyway. So basically the future is set 
but it's so complicated. There's no way for us to predict what it's going to be anyway. Do you not think you just can make the decision to change? Yeah, well, the, the factors that are that are going to cause that person to make a change are already in motion, are already set, and it's already going to happen. Yeah, so that I, I think I share most, like I think I share largely the same view in the sense that, um, like, even like either it's ever like in my mind at least either everything is determined, right? And so that would be sort of a fatalist view, like you end up you're gonna end up in this situation no matter what, right? It's complicated, you don't understand how how, how you're gonna end up there, but basically the future is set. But I think you can also sort of be more agnostic on, on the issue and 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 say that okay, if there is true randomness, that would be randomness that it's not just a placeholder for things that we don't understand, but actually like true randomness, whatever that might mean, then you can also say, okay, we, it, it might not be determined in the sense that you can, um, but there is a specific place that you're going to end up in uh, that, that is already yeah, determined, but, but it could be that there are a number of places that you could, uh, could end up in. But I don't think that even, yeah. if, you're, even if you have randomness, you're not in control of the, those things. So uh, at the end of the day, I don't think, like to answer your question, I think, um, and this, this might actually, uh, we might actually, uh, need to get into some other thing because uh, when we talk about compatibilism, I think there is also this this view that w where compatibilist a compatibilist might redefine free will in a sense and say that you know something is a free action if you're not sort of limited by anything other than than your experience of the will. And and if in, in that sense, I would yeah. say, okay, yeah, then free will exists because I don't think like I think um, there is a meaningful distinction between, uh, or actually there is a distinction I should say. Between you know when you do something because you want to or because like there is some other thing from the outside that is like I don't know a gun to your head or something where you will is even though it's still your will as as Chesh said before like you still could choose to just be shot in the head I guess but there is like the severe external thing that is uh, imposing on your will so in, in that sense you know if, if we define free will in that sense I would say yeah that there is free will but I don't think that ultimately if, if we take like the other the definitions of free will, the ability to do otherwise, I don't think uh, that is the case. I, I think I'm starting to come to the conclusion that that free will is how we describe an experience and isn't actually a thing. Yeah. And so if we take it as in we, it feels like we're making decisions and we can decide about our futures. We can choose to make changes about how our lives are going to end up because we can see more than one pathway of what, what we could do in our lives that would make those changes. I think the factors that determine which decision you make are, are determined. Those, those, those exist. The, you, those variables are already set in place. It's the butterfly effect. But the experience of going through life without that information, because we just don't have it. I could probably, like, if I had enough information, I could plot out somebody's life exactly, even when, oh, well, they interacted with this person and that one interaction they have is actually going to change their course. If I have the information knowing that they're going to interact with that person, then I can predict that. But because we go through life without that information and without enough knowledge to be that predictable or to be able to make those, to, to make that prediction in the future, uh, uh, except for certain things, it, it's free will describes the experience of going through a life without that knowledge. Yeah. On this subject, you, you 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 brought up though, Luke, about the the rewind time. Um, I I would agree that I don't think that going back in time, um, you'd be able to necessarily choose any differently because you you'd rewind your knowledge as well. I mean, if you put me back yeah. with my current knowledge, I might choose something yeah. different. But yeah. if you rewound it exactly, you wouldn't. But Dave, you actually said something on our free will episode that I found interesting is the fact that you actually thought that if we did rewind time, there might be a chance that you would choose something different. Okay. Um, that's because, and Luke can correct me if I'm wrong here, but sometimes when we recall stuff, it's linked to other stuff in our brain. And our memory might be affected slightly differently depending on what we recall. So mm -hmm. in those social schemas that are recalled, there's that element of randomness to it. 
and it's possible that we may choose something that we wouldn't have chosen otherwise. Okay, so fair enough. I mean, if you were to read it because of like quantum physics, if you were to go back in time and because quantum physics, as far as we know, again, this is a lack of knowledge, it, it appears random, then at the same time, in the same place, this different quantum physics event could take place, it changes everything. But we can, again, quantum physics is random to us right now. Will it always be? Is it actually yeah. random? That's, that is quite no. interesting. And, and even even if even if you grant that it is random, right? Like rewinding the clock would then still you you will end up with an, a random action. It still wouldn't be you making the decision. An actual freeze. Yeah, it still it, wouldn't it, be your choice. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's what Philip's trying to get at here when he's saying, "What is the you making the choice?" What is it over and above the biology and the the smashing together of atoms and the firing of neurons that gives you the the ability to actually choose? What is the driving force that allows you to choose rather than it being like a pachinko ball going through the brain and giving you your choice? Mm -hmm. So do you, Philip, do you yeah. basically regard us as NPCs within a game? Okay. Um, yeah, I would say so. Like, I, I know this sounds bad, but yes, I, I guess. No, no, no. Oh, Determinists do. So that, that, that's yeah. what I was just wondering. Yeah. yeah, I would say so. And again, I, I think this is like this brings us to very interesting. Like, if, if you accept determinism, there is there's some work to be done in in morality. You know. Oh yeah. So that that's a very interesting uh, aspect of it. But yeah, I, I would essentially say that I think. Right now, I lean towards that, that idea, yes. Or rather than to choose your own adventure book. Yeah, I would. Yeah, again. Yeah, I, I, I really don't think. Like, I know a lot of people here want to say that there is like a, a limited set of things that are truly free. I don't even think that there is a limited set of things that are truly yeah. free. I don't think that there is any uh, free action. If you knew how you were going to die, would you change what you did in life? And so the answer is is some kind sometimes yes and sometimes no. It kind of depends on how specific the prediction is. You're going to die of lung cancer. Do you still smoke cigarettes or not? Would you die? Because of lung they might if you not stopped. be <laughs> right. You don't know. Because the answer the answer is no matter what, you're dying of lung cancer. The cigarettes when? might be causing it, they might you don't know. You're going to die of lung cancer. So, Context matters, damn it. <laughs> right, but that's the thing. Sometimes knowing how you die changes nothing about how you behave in life because what are you going to do about it? You fall down some stairs. Great. Tomorrow? <laughs> like, what does that mean? <laughs> yeah, I guess the, there's an interesting question about the prediction that because it, it, is it a prediction of of the like what would have happened if you didn't know the information that you just got? Because that's sort of changing. The you don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so if 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 we let's let's go back to the LeBay experiments because I think there's a lot of misunderstanding within uh, the discussion around free will. From that, they weren't a hundred percent. They were not a hundred percent at all. So, and if 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 you thought if if people think that there's this underlying driving force pushing up, um, you would expect that. You would expect a hundred percent prediction rate. But it was more like sixty percent. It was significant. It was a pretty high uh, effect size, but it wasn't a hundred. And I guess for me, that's that says that there are there are people who are just making conscious decisions in that moment, Wait, and. That's an arbitrary choice. Is that is the, is is the experiment the one where they they attempted to predict what people would choose like before? Would, would... Just it's pushing a button with left or right. Hand. Yeah, and saying when they felt the actual choice to do it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I am aware of that. Yeah, I guess like I I don't like to talk about that that one because I don't really like I know there's a lot of controversy surrounding it as well uh, so I'm not that, that's why I prefer sort of to stay in the uh, competing wills uh, domain because that also applies even if you're not a physicalist right that, that would also carry over in a sense um, but like I still don't understand like how this would work even even if you grant that the experiment is not perfect or whatever um, 
if you if you're a physicalist in the sense about about the mind right and and everything every mental state um, that you have is ultimately you know grounded in in physical matter you can you can construct very complex sort of uh, I guess neural networks uh, and, and and chains of causality within within uh, sort of yeah um, neurons and stuff like that that can you know uh, give give rise to a lot of complex possible interactions like just look at computers and stuff like that but ultimately it's still it's still about you know how these little things interact which I guess you know are either determined or random and I don't I don't see how as a physicalist you could you could get out of that. Is it is it is it just determined or random? Yeah, that's the, you will, I guess that's the question because then I would sort of need to understand what that other thing might be, and and it seems to oh. me that you know it, it gets it gets into the territory of sort of some sort of dualism almost, right? Because then you have sort of this soul aspect of, of it a, a bit at least. Right. There's something else. Yeah, so this is. I think this goes back to a question that Dave asked me earlier about the the, the whether the mental state can impact the physical state. And I gave a, kind of an answer about well, that's how CBT works. So cognitive behavioral therapy is based on you know thoughts, feelings, uh, emotions, f physical feelings, emotions, and um, behavior. Yeah, and it works on uh, cognition, which is your thought processes and your behavior, and you can change your thought processes through cognitive restructuring. Um, which actually changes the pathways that you're using in the brain, and it's an it's a concerted effort. And then, a, yeah, you've you've made you basically trained yourself to in which by thinking something by doing something metaphysical, you change a physical yeah. aspect in your brain to build neuro pathways. So that way, those are the pathways your brain uses instead of the ones you were using before, which were causing you problems. And, and, and uh, you know, brain plasticity works in a similar way. So uh, you, you train your brain in the, or you, you practice a certain skill for a prolonged period of time, and then your brain reforms its neural connections in order to accommodate that to make that easier. Yeah, so like taxi drivers, uh, when they learn all the streets and stuff, will have yeah. a bigger uh, spatial navigational area in the brain. And you I guess... Have, like physical stimulus to, or uh, to... In, in, to in Ice endorphins to be released in your brain and things like that. So you can, um, if you're studying math, if you're in high school and you're studying math, light this incense. Yeah, get a lighter, get a clicker, and then just keep that smell with you when you go to your exam. It'll take your yeah. brain into being it's math mode, and you you may use a different scent for English, use a different scent for whatever, and you do the same thing with like, oh, I'm in a really good mood. I'm gonna play this song. So now every time I play this song, I think of all the good things that. I remember all these happy stuff. Yeah. yeah now, but I guess. Sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. So I guess. I guess I agree. There is a foundation, uh, of, like, uh, so like genetics or or kind of like uh, you know, we're genetically predisposed in certain areas. So there's a foundation that leads those decisions. Yeah. Stuck with your base stats. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. But 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 you can alter your base stats. Yeah, we can transcend those those so you know we're 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 animals yeah but we every day we're, we're challenging our instincts yeah and you can you can practice challenging your instincts people that go on diets or people that go on bad diets you know where they uh, reduce the amount they i don't eating. know what you're talking about <laughs> you know they're, they're challenging their behavior and i guess i guess uh the the kind of as an analogy i gave uh dave to think about and i'd be interested to see whether he's had to think about it he might not have, is you know if we developed an ai that had uh had a specific programming and it decided that so it was obviously complex enough to uh to be able to kind of rationalize for itself and it decided that it wanted to change its behavior in a certain way and it started to rewrite its own programming would we consider that an element of free will so can i just or oh, do you want to respond directly, Dave? Oh, you go ahead. I'm yeah, going to respond tomorrow on the Discord. <laughs> like, oh, I have yeah. to wait. <laughs> <laughs> no, my, 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 my concern here is if, you, if you're a physicalist, right, then it seems to me that you're committed to the idea that whatever mental state you had that sort of started the process of restructuring your brain, right, 
whatever that that mental state is, that experience of the mental state that you that you start that kicked off this whole process of trying to re rewrite your brain into this other direction with with cognitive behavioral therapy or stuff like that. That if you're a physicalist would also be a just a physical process ultimately because that's that's what it reduces down to ultimately. I'm not sure if they're mutually exclusive ideas. In, in what sense? I don't... It, but I, and I say this. I think. I think this is what I said as well. We're self. We uh, so normally in physical processes, you have cause and effect due to energy uh, yeah. being distributed in certain areas, right? Yeah. We develop our own energy. Well, we we consume fuel, and then that energy gets transferred. But then uh, that energy can be directed in a way that that we kind of desire in a specific sense. So, so would you say that the that the energy? I mean, would you say that machine works, right? I'm sorry, it, that machine gets comp it's the same way a machine works, right? Not, not re like, not really, because it, like a machine ultimately is basically a bunch of logic gates stringed together, right? You have you have logic gates, and the, 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 they, they, they do the same thing every time. Like if they get the signals on one side, you have an end gate, and you get signals in, in both input gates, then it it, it it streams the output gate. Or if you just have an, an one, then it doesn't continue, right? But of course, stacking a lot of them in a complex scenario, you can create. A system where you have you have sort of competing uh, sort of structures of these things, and, and you might have like um, even maybe a strength system where like if if one accumulates more points, then it's going to override whatever the other side is doing. But ultimately, whatever wh whenever you take a snapshot, let's say of, of the situation, it's it's clear as daylight what is going to happen because all of these gates have a very clear like instruction on what they're going to do, and so you could. From that snapshot, predict exactly what is going to happen. There is no other thing there, and so in the same way, and, and like I guess I could respond to the idea of the robot there. Like if if you give it a programming and you, and you say, okay, let's say that we give you a, a program that has this that keeps this score on how I don't know um, how happy you are or something, right? Like this this value of of happiness that is generated according to some internal sensors about the the how well the circuit works or something like that right and you could say okay that that thing is going is going to determine a bunch of other actions that you're going to take but of course of course depending on the, that value itself you're going to take like the robot can effectively uh, do different things in a sense but it, it like it's still part of the programming that that is going to happen or or if you have like a different set like different programs that are going to ultimately end up in a contradiction then it's probably like either a random thing that's going to happen i don't know what, what would happen depending on the logic you use i guess if it's but, but that's beside the point so, right it's still, i think we do run into, if we use the base stats as sort of like a an analogy you do run into the thing that your base stats can go into the negative you can you can get your base stats up, but you can also get your base stats down. So if you have a certain amount of strength, you can lose strength if you're not doing that thing or that activity. So you can you can start off with these things and then still end up with garbage in one of the things you were good at. But if you want to talk about whether or not there there is like there is a base that you have when you're born and that's when everything starts even arguably before you popped out however you want to put that together but you get to start off in this area you don't really get to change what you've started with but you can pick and choose uh, at a certain point you don't even get to pick and choose right away you're a baby you don't get any options at all <laughs> a lot of people don't even get to start really making any decisions for themselves until they're like 16 to 18 and even then sometimes people aren't making decisions for themselves for their whole lives there are some people that just rely on other people entirely to make all of their decisions or do, do everything for them essentially but you've also got people Go through life not making cognitive decisions about what they do or do not believe and not thinking rationally through what they do and do not believe or why they do and do not do a certain action right but if you want to still go through the sort of determinist uh route and um the physical route it's not just you your starting point wasn't just when you started your starting point was your parents starting points and their parents starting points and their parents start there's there's a long history uh, to get to the point 
where we're at in the situation that we're in that affects our behaviors and affects whether we said people still have monkey brain. <laughs> there are people that go around that you wake up in the middle of the night and all you want to do is drink a lot of glass of water. And it's just like, thank you, fish brain. <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess this, this is, this is the reason why I, when I interrupted the FFA with my <laughs> views that, that I argued that, that free will isn't something that everybody necessarily has. Cause, cause um, there are people who purely act on their instincts and there's people that purely act and, and they can't regulate their behavior and they can't uh, or they're, they're impaired in some way that stops them from being able to kind of make conscious decisions and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And that's why I would argue that free will isn't necessarily a given individual. There's also, yeah. you said there were certain yeah. people with certain types of, was it psychosis, um, that technically have more free will. That wasn't me, I don't think. No, I, I asked the question to you, and you said yes. I, I don't know. I don't see why you right? couldn't go both yeah. ways. Why, I, like, why if wouldn't they I... had a certain uh, something in there, something happened where it, it actually changed. It. So they, their programming. So I suppose it's this way: like they, their programming was disrupted enough that they, I think it would probably actually take the path from the conversation tonight that it adds an element of randomness, but rather than you it could adds remove... an element of free will. Um, you can remove like inhibition if you have somebody who's or somebody who is incapable of feeling pain. Somebody who's incapable of feeling pain isn't going to use that aspect of being concerned about hot yeah. or cold or or they're going to be injured. There's no reason to feel that fear of being injured because or you're not going to react to having a cut on your hand because there's no indication in your brain that ow that hurts. I need to deal with this problem. There's people yeah, and I think really early on in their lives <laughs> they have life it's like half of normal people to people that don't feel pain it's shocking sorry that was a segue yeah. no i just <laughs> wanted to say luke that i think that you accurately predicted what my reply would be that with, with your example about the this part of the brain because as you said i think it's like i could i feel like at least i could um explain that by just saying okay there's this other section of the brain that grew and, and, and it grew because like there's this all this social desire to 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 be like um to fit into society to do all these things and that is like sort of the competing desire that sort of represses all the uh, immediate uh, instinctual things that you would do because like you have this whole communication layer you have a much more evolved like sort of uh, understanding of yeah, I guess society as a human, uh, is it society and other people. And so that is sort of what is doing the, the, the work there. That is that is doing the work of um, creating this competing thing that is enabling you to, in most cases, overcome the, the base, base desires, I guess. Can I, so, slightly separate question. Yeah. Not everybody's base desires not necessarily being the same is also hilarious. <laughs> Do you think that um, when a decision comes up that we are therefore obligated in our decision? I think you don't know um, what you're going to do. I, I don't think you're obligated in the sense that I don't think obligation is really obligation. Really makes sense only makes sense if if you actually have free will in the first place. I think because you could do otherwise, but you have to do this this one thing. Um, I would say that it is going to be um, completely out of your control, whatever whatever you're going to choose. But I don't think I don't know if obligated would be the right because it wouldn't be really an external thing that, that would make you. I guess there would be an external thing, but it's 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 sort of getting at the <laughs> at the at the conversation that we had before of, of distinguishing, you know, the experience of free will and something like a compatibilist view on free will, where you could say that you know you're free if there is nothing external. And so I would say in that sense um, that you are not uh, for for any given decision, you are not um, not being forced to do anything. Um, in in that compatibilist framework, unless there is really something external to your world that would, that would like significantly impact it, impact it. But it, but in a more like a high abstraction layer, I guess. Like I I think yes, that that whatever you're gonna end up doing is gonna be either determined or random, and so out of your control. Yeah, I'm still going with the listen. There are determining factors, but the determining factors are so beyond our comprehension to be able to process every single one and some that we just don't have access to know. 
that it may as well be free will and it may as well be random. So I think that kind of is, um, uh, is it Daniel Dennett's view? Right. He, he, I think he says about diplomatic, a diplomatic approach to it, where it's like, uh, because of that kind of line of thinking, free will. Oh, like, yeah, it, well it's free will and you have no choice in the matter, sort of, <laughs> like the, the Hitchens thing. And, and, and the answer is, is like, I can't be you. I might be able to be sympathetic. I might be able to be empathetic towards you. But if you describe to me a pain, I can only liken it to my own pain. I, I can't feel your pain. And so because there's just things that are inaccessible to us as individuals, you cannot possibly have enough of the information you would need to be able to predict what, mm -hmm. uh, what would be predictable if we were able to access that information. So I guess, I, I guess I'm just stuck on this either it's determined or it's random and i'm not sure are you saying that's a true no i'm saying i'm just saying so i think i obviously think most of the universe is determined and i don't think we can get is out there that. anything that is not but determined it's not, sorry and not if random. it's not determined it doesn't have to be random i'm not sure about that i think could it could being it being controlled be a third option. I, guess, I mean, it's, I, it's not... possible, like the random part is controlled. Like, I, I guess, yeah, yeah. sure. It's, I guess. Yeah. How do you, would it truly be random then, though? No, I think you're Probably going not. into sort of almost predeterminism there. Like you've got a conscious entity no, 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 actually no, determine everything. Yeah. Who it? Who oh, so, so, so not the outside factors, the personal factors. You, like right. I can control my mental state by making a conscious decision to be like, listen, yeah. today I'm going to have a good day. I'm determined to have a good day. So you've yeah. determined <laughs> that this is a good day. That balance, that balance is the... Um... I don't know what that balance is. My brain went again. <laughs> that keeps happening tonight. <laughs> <laughs> but like, okay, so that balance is the, the fact that we can predict people's decisions with the other thing, with the fact that it's Well, not, you yeah. can predict somebody's decisions based on how well you un have an understanding of that individual. Now, that can be yeah. based on psychology. It can be based on uh, philosophy of like, even just humans in general, or even biology of how well you happen to have an understanding of humans as a species. Um, so it kind of depends if you're talking like, can you predict a, an individual's life in general? Yeah. In a really general <laughs> sense, you can predict everyone's life because everybody's life is pretty similar. Big ticket uh, items. If, yeah. If yeah. you're going to talk about whether or not they're estranged from their family, you can, if you have enough information about their family and them as an individual, if you know whether or not they're the black sheep of the, if they have, or if they have like a very religious family and they decide they end up being not terribly well, religious, if you know that information, then that's. I mean, this is quite. This is like a really interesting aspect to psychology because psychology is the science of uh, behavior in the mind of individuals. Yeah. Yeah. But we use general statistics and like a, a group of people to to analyze that right so we can say 60 percent of people do x therefore we can predict that more people will do x right right psychology is in its current form is pretty bad at predicting individuals behavior yeah there's like just not enough there, there hasn't been enough like, almost <laughs> data collection, I would say, plus with society making changes yeah. on a whole, especially as rapidly as we have been doing recently, plus with the advent of yeah. the Internet, you've added an entirely new social structure to the human existence. And now you've taken people from South America are, are, are hanging out with people in Russia and people in Russia are hanging out with people in Iceland and people in Iceland are hanging out with people in Zimbabwe. Like it's no, there's such the like <laughs> Canada, yeah. Italy, England, Wales. Yeah. <laughs> 
it changes everything. So not only has psychology kind of had to struggle in that it, it fell behind due to various litigation, but also in access to how to study it, um, and, and like lacking in tech in the technological field of like what tools we utilize to even study this, but also the just drastic changes to social structure and the as well as economics and business which changes an individual's outlook if you really want a good way to sort of see where like society's brain is at look at movies look at tv series yeah once upon a time we had the jetsons and people were looking forward to what the future was going to be like then now we're dealing with fallout and everything's going to be garbage and everything's going to be a dystopia <laughs> oh. And you know the the link the link there is economic collapse. Every time there's a yep. economic collapse, there is a more apocalyptic movies that come out. Yep, because like that, it's such a it's such a factor in how we because it imitates and perceives yeah. reality and vice versa. So yeah, if you well, like like horror always uh, flex the 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 fears of the the society the, that's created in. Yeah, so that's why you see um, different kinds of monsters in different places. The the Wendigo is is a creature from the forest that you don't understand. From a, it's an outside force. Aliens versus zombies, an outside force punishing humanity for the sins, it, doing the same thing to us that we've done to everything else. And then zombies are the society's fear of just becoming drones to themselves. Right? It's there's so much to it. <laughs> we, hey. Did we choose to create any of these characters? Uh, <laughs> I want, you haven't been talking much. Yes, but also no. <laughs> <laughs> wise man, please. I'm not the wise man, he's down there. <laughs> Why is Gamora? <laughs> you ever heard of something called the Placid Oh, hang on, I need to go grab my plug-in headphones. My things are dying. I'll be I two minutes. It. Oh. Uh, he was just about to impart some wisdom and he fucked off. <laughs> Damn it. Did he choose to? Did he have no choice Not in the matter? He had no choice in the matter if he wanted to be able to hear us. So that was completely Well, yeah, but he going to talk to us. He doesn't need to hear us if he's going to tell us. <laughs> true. <It's> true. <laughs> he's just using it as an excuse to go get another drink, I reckon. I mean, I don't blame him. The thing is, <laughs> you can study human history to predict how humans are going to behave. Like, if you want a really good example, like kind of topical, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna date this. It's essentially Germany <laughs> and <laughs> patriotism and America right now. <laughs> so, yeah. 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 Nationalism. <laughs> yeah, it's coming down a similar route. So. Uh... Sorry, I missed you there. The UK is is going down a similar route currently. Uh, well, there's a couple of spots in Canada that are starting to go that way, and they're just getting like new. Like they're not having a good time up here. <laughs> go on, so, Dave. Go on. <laughs> and he's mess. probably waiting for them to connect. Change of sound settings. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Nice one. Okay. Have you heard of Laplace's demon or Laplace's demon? I think you told me about it. You told me about it. Yeah. Okay. It's a demon that knows the position of every atom and everything in the universe and knows how everything works. If this demon knows all the positions of the atoms in your brain and how your brain works, could it use that information to determine the choice that you make? That is the question, isn't it? Wait, what? I wasn't yeah. listening. <laughs> well, I'll just go then. <laughs> if the demon and is... if the answer to that is yes, then your thoughts and actions are determined. I think your thoughts and actions are determined. I just think that there's so many factors that you would never know that that was the case. Yeah, sure. I, I can yeah, that. but it's that would still be determined. I'm going to R and R this and yes, say, "Give me exactly." Yes. <laughs> I need evidence this one exists. <laughs> <laughs> I'm right here. <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay. So are you just talking about the physical properties of the brain there, Dave, with that with that demon? Are you saying yeah. Yeah. physical properties of the brain? Uh, Think of something like Mary's room. Um, but instead of Mary going out and like learning the what it feels like mm. to see red. Imagine she just uses those things to determine that somebody is going to see the color red. Uh, are we going to get so into whether or not the color predict... red is real or not? <laughs> no, no, no. She can't predict what it's going to feel like for that person to see red, but she can determine that the that light's hitting see. the eyes in the corner. How did, how that did they will I mean, that makes red. sense it's because red can... Like that in one sentence, Dave. I hate you so much. <laughs> well, red, red can uh, okay so i do art and you can use different colors to elicit different emotions in people and you can use the same color to elicit different emotions depending on what the context is around that color and what it's being used for if i present a rose to you and that rose is white and i've splashed red onto that rose it's going to be different than i if i present to you a, a picture of a rose and the rose is just red you will feel differently about that color red because of the context around it and what it seems to represent to you. Blood splatter. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So, but this, it, for it, the context, I think we should just briefly mention Mary's room, just if people aren't aware of that thought experiment. Um, are, are all of you aware of the Mary's room? No? Okay. I don't know nothing about nothing. <laughs> all right, well, Hello, Socrates. <laughs> Dave, do you want to uh, explain that one? Okay, Mary uh, Mary's room is a thought experiment by Frank Jackson, and it's the idea that you have this scientist named Mary who's lived in a black and white room her whole life, and she has only ever seen black and white things. Eventually, she learns everything that there is to know about the physical facts of sight, sound, everything like that. Now, when Mary leaves the room, she encounters color for the first time. Does she learn something new about how the world is? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, so knowing all the physical facts of how something works doesn't necessarily tell us what an experience is. Oh, correct. Well, you humans are not, yeah, humans are not fully logical beings. If you, uh, there are people who try and do this. They will deny that human beings are emotional. And they'll say like, listen, no, you, you ought to make every decision that you ever make off of the reasoning as to why you're making that decision. But in that reasoning, they remove or discount the emotional aspect. Like it or not, we are emotional. We yeah. have emotions. We have responses to things. And those are part of your rational existence. If you want to rationalize and justify something, you need to take your feelings into account. Because if you don't, you're going to have a really bad time. And does anybody really want to have a bad time? And for what reason are you going to have a bad time? None. There is, you're, you're making yourself have a bad time for no reason at all. And you're not very rational now, are you? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and the thing about that as well is that's a good example here um, to do with Mary's room in that you get a lot of atheists who will say, well, sadness is just a chemical reaction. Your emotions are just chemical reactions, but they aren't just chemical reactions. There's something that we experience and we might look at the chemical reactions, but we can't say what. The, yeah, the what chemical reaction like. might be yeah. the cause, but the the. Um... The experience, the experience that you have yeah. because of the, that chemical reaction is still an experience that has happened, and you have to take those. This is why you kind of end up with with atheists saying that your experience with God doesn't matter; it doesn't count; it's not real evidence. And the thing is, is that no, it is. It counts. It might not count for much to you, and it might count very little, but is it is still a factor? Period. Yeah. Right? Um, so if if we think of Laplace's demon in something like that, he couldn't predict what the experience might feel like. But if the demon is smart enough and knows enough, he can know what is going to come or what decision you might make based on the positions of atoms in your brain. Yeah, that, that is the question that Joe... Yeah, that, that's, 
that's the question that is really important Let to ask when discovering whether we that's have free okay. will. Yeah. Feminism is true then, right? <laughs> Every time you have a brain fart, it's, it's actually quantum energy just appearing in your brain and then kicking off at random when it decides to. Yeah, I mean, I'm happy to, I'm happy to grant that, but I think again, it, it doesn't salvage like free will at all. Like, even if you say that you it? couldn't, yeah, even if you say right. it, and actually on that point, I wanted to go like before you ask uh -huh. me if it's just <laughs> randomness or just sort of determined, but I think. Like there, is, there can be sort of a combination of, of these two that creates, like, like for instance, if you have two d6 or like six-sided die, um, and, and like it, there are outcomes that are more likely because of, of the overall scenario, right? Let's just so, assume that they're completely perfectly weighted, though, in this example. Yeah, it's still right. If you have two of them, like a six is sevens and eight, seven is the most likely outcome, and followed by a six and eight, and so on, and then it goes yeah. up gradually. You know that if you play games, yeah, yeah. When and, what you had for breakfast that morning determines how you did on a test three days from now. <laughs> yeah, and I think like you can have sort of this kind of combination of the two, and and but but still, right? Even if you have this combination, it's still not going to be like it's not going to say say free will, right? But, like it's not like because you have two dice now and it's not okay. completely like a new position. A new position. <laughs> <laughs> yes, here we go. I'm sorry, this happens to me a lot when you speak to me. Oh right. Determinism is almost certainly true. <laughs> but free will I think I still think free will should be discussed uh as I don't think it's useful to to just to to completely rule out free will as a as a as a way of driving people to to make decisions essentially. Yeah, because there is I like think... psychological studies that show that people that hold deterministic views quite solidly in their mind uh, make poorer decisions for their life outcomes because they they think they have no control, so they don't therefore take responsibility and don't take control of their behavior. I think there's a difference. Yeah, I think there needs to be a difference between free will and self control. You have self-control. You can make decisions about what you do and do not decide to do. That's still up to you. What your future is going to be is still something that you get to decide to do as an individ individual. It's just that you are going to decide to do that anyway. <laughs> I guess I guess when we're thinking about the... Because I see this a lot. I see this a lot. The, the brain is... Uh, like, the amount... Of, when we're talking about neurons firing and neurons firing and stuff, like people go like this connection to this connection to this connection and like if three connections and it's like there are trillions there are trillions of neurons in your brain not it's not that simple it's not like oh it's just this this and this and it's not like this area is specifically like for this area it connects to other areas and there's there's literally trillions of pathways so, so when we're thinking about those decision making and that stuff and that, like how we how we control it in that it's not as simple as as uh like like so, for instance, the causal factor for something will be we're never going to find it out. So we might as well have free will, right? Is that is that yeah? That fair statement. Free will is the ex in, in my. I'm coming to the point that free will describes the experience of living life, not yeah. knowing those factors. Yeah, I would say so. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But so, so the, cause, I, can, the causal factor can is so I, far removed from from. Sorry. I just uh, I want to make an analogy to your three prong. It's like I got an F on my test. My dad beat me. I did meth. <laughs> You're yeah, jumping exactly. some points here. Yeah, exactly. So, 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 so well, now I agree with you guys. <laughs> I'm still not completely convinced. <laughs> right? I've been. I've been. Yeah, sorry. Uh, I'm thinking about the demon. Right? I think I'm thinking about the demon. Okay, don't <laughs> my mind again. Right? So. I can't handle that. <laughs> Joey, he's stuck on breakfast, ruining his test three days from now. <laughs> how? How did my breakfast ruin my test? I don't even eat breakfast. Damn it. <laughs> well, maybe that's exactly the problem. <laughs> uh, so the demon, right? It can, it can see all the neural pathways. It can see all the physical things that are going on in your brain. But everyone's brain chemistry is that little bit different. So, 
it wouldn't like we said with Mary's room, it wouldn't be able to predict the experience that they had, right? Because the, the physical facts are different to the physical experience, as you were, or the mental experience. So in the same thing, the decisions that go on, just because you can see all those neural pathways firing off, you might have an idea of, well, they'll probably choose that, but... Yeah, but you, if it understands oh no, that oh no. brain chemistry is different, it will yeah, understand how that... Yeah. yeah. So we'll put it this way. You might be able to predict what somebody's experience is. You might, you might be able to predict that this person is going to, these neurons are going to fire and these synapsids are going to happen and these chemicals are going to react. And so it's likely that this person is going to feel this way. And because of their history and who they've been around and who their parents are, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, they are going to respond to that feeling in this way. Now, there's another factor that we don't know. There's information that we don't have. And because there's information we don't have, that person, unbeknownst to our prediction, might decide, no, I'm not going to lash out today. I'm tired. My hand hurts from punching walls all day. I've decided that I'm not going to lash out in anger and I'm going to be more productive with my anger from now on. But that's because there are factors that we just don't know and cannot predict for. But that doesn't mean those factors don't exist and aren't predetermined. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And no. even if they were, even if they if they did not exist, like at that point you still have like a model like with the two die example that I gave before, right? Like you have certain mm -hmm. things that are more likely that you can observe, like from the perspective of the demon, you can say, okay, the next the next most likely thing is this pathway and it's gonna lead probably to this action or whatever. But uh, even if you don't have the complete information on that, you still can have a like a likelihood likeliness distribution on these things and mm -hmm. You know, randomness is going to play its game, but you know, you wouldn't still be able to choose. Yeah. This, this, this actual concept, and it, it, it's kind of making sense in my brain now, which is really frustrating. Actually, linked <laughs> into my view of consciousness. So, which is, which yeah. is, you know, kind of, kind of, um, it doesn't avoid, but it kind of like negates the 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 need for the to solve the hard problem of consciousness. Because uh, so so Anil Set uh, is a neuroscientist and he's working on consciousness and how we experience a conscious world, and it's about kind of our brain making predictions about the world, mixing that with the sensory data that we have, and then we get our experience of, of the world essentially, and um, therefore it's all these different systems amalgamating together, which gives us the illusion that we're having one experience, one uh, conscious experience, and that exactly is the same as uh, this. This, this free will experience and yeah. it's frustrating that that's not how I linked it in my brain before <laughs> and, so, and some people are better at understanding other people than others some people are more sympathetic some people are more empathetic some people aren't able to be sympathetic or empathetic some people are way too empathetic and some people were perfectly fine and then something has happened to them and now they can't do that thing and so when you have something that's like maybe more unpredictable like an accident or something happens to your brain where you get whacked in the head too hard and now suddenly somebody who's the nicest person on the planet who just like playing football beats their wife and does cocaine yeah, I think though that like the, the whole um, experience of, of but this might go into like philosophy of mind, so maybe it's not the, the appropriate place to talk about it. But I think um, there's still some weirdness going on with the whole hard problem of consciousness. I think yeah. because ultimately, even if you, even if you take the computer analogy um, about you know that the fact that what we see on the computer is is not directly what we would mm -hmm. like uh, conceive by just looking at the thing, it, it's still like uh, the whole uh, chemistry of it and the whole uh, ele electrons going up and down and stuff like that. It is still true, I think, that if you know all facts, all physical facts about the state that the machine is in, you can you can sort of understand precisely like what what the machine is displaying, what the machine is doing, which is not it is not the same as with consciousness, because as we told, like with Mary's room experiment, right? Even knowing all the facts about the brain doesn't give you this experience. And that is not the same as with the computer, because knowing all but the facts- But you're about lacking right, information though you. still too, right? Yeah. Because even if you have all the physical information about what the brain can and cannot do, it doesn't mean you actually have all of the information about what the brain is capable of or what the brain is capable sure, of experiencing. Sure. But, right? sure. right. So, so individual like, if the experience, experience is, like if the experience is that sort of brain structure, then knowing everything that is about that brain structure should technically 
give you the information of what well, it's like. Let me, to... let me provide a, a just just a quick analogy that might yeah. might uh, challenge that slightly. So imagine we have yeah. an AI that um, is really good at uh, chess. Yeah, which is proved we have it. We have AIs that can be chess masters, right? Yeah. And they run computational uh, information uh, that the kind of um, they play they play games, right? But we don't see them playing games. How do you know that that AI isn't having an experience of playing those games within its? Oh, I, that, that's the question, right? That leads yeah. you to panpsychism, essentially, right? That is uh, sort of like the view that, uh, that it's like something uh, for ev almost everything. Actually, everything but, probably through panpsychism. That that AI is having is 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 engaging in information processing. Whereas, well, is a dog does a dog have an experience? Yeah, that's yeah. Well, yeah no, I think that. So, so, but like panpsychism, from what I am aware of it, is that there's a there's an underlying consciousness to to like the like atomic world that then gets gets um like filtered through uh brain stroke, but through um like I don't know how to put I it. I don't think it's like it's more like the way i understand it right that it's like something like for everything that you have it's it's like something to be that thing right so if you have an like if there is an experience there is a first person view of everything even though that that might not look like information processing like it might be something completely static something that doesn't have any choice any free will whatsoever it's not saying that like atoms is the same the, the atoms have it, having a brain or something it's merely okay. saying that it's yeah. something yeah. like i guess i guess my view is <laughs> that it requires processing like that so so for instance the brain uh, dave dave says there needs to be a brain for there to be a mind yeah and the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell <laughs> yeah, exactly. what the what the brain is is electrical signals that produce uh, uh, a representation of the world that we live in. Yeah, but but then uh, the question would be, you know, what um, sort of at what point of information processing does consciousness emerge? Because like ultimately, a computer is a, a form of information processing, and, and even if you have just a simple logic gate, gate, like an end gate, as I said before, that is some form of information processing. So, is a logic gate conscious at that point, or a transistor? So, oh, so this, like right, that. and you still run into the problem. Yeah. Like you still run into things that, like, just because something experiences consciousness different than the way we experience it, doesn't necessarily make it the same thing. So, something could yeah, experience yeah, yeah. consciousness. Well, then, like, just because that thing is not capable of feeling pain, does that mean it does not experience yeah, yeah, it, life? Well, and the answer yeah. is, well, well I, maybe it does. And and so, like, what factors are relevant that what that a machine would need to verify or count as conscious that we would consider it to be conscious? Yeah, that's, does that's it, need does it need to have memory? Does it need to have the ability to create? Does it need to have the ability to make decisions? Does it need to be able to reflect on itself? Parrots can look in a mirror and recognize their self. One of the, one of the uh, big, one of the more the larger breakthroughs um, was a gray parrot who looked at itself in the mirror and asked what color it was. It was gray, which was really funny, but, <laughs> okay. but it, it had that sense of self. What what color am I? I think I I, I don't mean to rain on your parade but the the gray parrot studies are massively <laughs> massively flawed They're oh so of course flawed. they are it's a parrot <laughs> uh, yeah no but like like so if if like ravens and magpies and crows uh, their studies are, and it feels like gray parrots because they imitate uh speech that people yeah. anthropomorphize them and think that you know it said what color are you and it's like it suddenly understands language there was a study that said that uh there was a gray parrot that understood the language of a four-year-old and it could say like 200 words and not 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 create grammar or anything like yeah, that. Yeah, the like, oh, have good speech. Like, what are you talking about? Yeah, it was about the um, whether or not the parrot recognized that it recognized itself in a mirror, and also then asked about itself. That was the that was the supposed to be the big deal. One of the fun things you can do with a dog is you can say words into buttons, and the, you, they press the button, and it says that word, and they can associate those words. So you could have like the dog. You could tell the dog you love the dog and the dog will recognize its name and it will press the button for its name and then we'll say love and then you or you could the the dog will recognize name of dog go outside name of dog go pool name of dog treat 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 
tree. <laughs> so so you can you can kind of have a dog trained in a way that it recognizes these concepts it recognizes these experiences of being in the backyard and it recognizes the word backyard and associates that with the experience of where they're going to go and oh. has that under that spatial awareness of where that place is in its memory and so be, is it any more or less conscious if it's able to communicate in words that humans understand or did it love you the whole time and just oh. So, it had its own way of communicating. So I think, I think, I think there's la there's layers to consciousness, and I think that um, it's about kind of uh, it, it gets to a point where it's about ab abstract concepts. Like dogs are really bad for um, what's it called uh, matter conservation of like matter and and understanding. Like for instance, if you leave the house. That you're going to return like that's one of the oh, yeah the, their concept of time and yeah, like yeah, if you're gone yeah. they're you're gone forever that's why they're so excited when you come back they you were gone forever they counted and they thought you were never coming back <laughs> unless yeah. you're on a very strict schedule <laughs> so, so the so i guess with the 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 thing with, with animal sets and i recommend watching his i don't know dave if you've watched it yeah i sent it to you but the, the, with his like kind of view of it is that the hard problem of consciousness is uh, overcomplicating the systems, and that, that, like, because consciousness is essentially an illusion that the brain brings together, that we don't. It's not that we don't need to ask that question, but it's just that that that's not necessarily the question we should be asking. We just think we're better than everybody else. Look, watch. Hey, Pac. You want to go outside, girls? Oh, do. Do you want to go outside? <laughs> <laughs> oh. Do you want to go outside? No, that's cheesies. Outside? No. Why do you have oh, cheesies yeah, on I your know. head? It's late though, and I live in London. I'm in <laughs> I mean, here's something that might help Luke, and you'll appreciate this one. We okay. don't actually know that okay. much about the brain, and like not as much as we need to know to determine whether we have <laughs> the ability to make a choice or whether it's all determined. So there might be some discovery in the future that gives us the ability to find some driver in the sea. So, so I guess I guess that that reminded me of that all core thing, but that seemed a bit like we we, we uh, what's it called like wishy washy kind of stuff, the all core stuff where it's like quantum micro tubules. Um, yeah, but, but I didn't really understand it. But if it's quantum, then I guess that maybe there's an element of like uh, talk about and, randomness instead of actual probability. Yeah, so it's yeah. going to a probabilistic nature rather than uh, a free nature in that regard. I don't understand Orko at all. From what I read, it just seems a bit like woo woo. <laughs> so, so yeah. yeah, but yeah. it's woo woo, isn't it? That's that's what I've learned from Deepak Chopra. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it, it, free will might still be saved at some point in the future. At least some form of, say, even the veto uh, principle. I can't hold it as a rational belief right now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry to put you in an apparatic state. That's fine. Just wait till we go. At least you know. Just I'm wait till we do the. To change my yeah. belief when uh, I've been out out chest. <laughs> <laughs> Just wait until we get to the epistemology. You'll be sending hitmen yeah. after me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry to break you. <laughs> this is what happens when you have conversations with me. I'll just go. <laughs> that was good. Challenge. So, Dave, have you have you dropped your your compatibilist approach now? No. <laughs> I think you can still be a compatibilist. <laughs> still can I to be a compatibilist? Compatib compat I can't even yeah. say it. Compatibilist. <laughs> compatibilist. See, I told you he wants to kill me. <laughs> yeah, I think Op Oppy is a compatibilist, isn't he? And and he yeah. holds like yeah. he thinks that the, the, the things that are determined just that he, he sees pretty well as you know the, the thing that I was talking before like right so so, so no... is is if I describe compatibilism correctly please let me know so everything is determined but we have redefined free will to be like within that system yeah so yeah, that's, how that's how I would see it. at least that's how I understand yes 
but we have There'd be to, no yeah, way for you to it's... break physics and fly, right? So you can't just free will yourself to <laughs> flap, flap up <laughs> through <laughs> gravity. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I think even libertarian free will doesn't go that crazy. No, but... I don't think. I don't think it's <laughs> no. Like, this isn't pure. We're not going to Peter Pan our way happy thoughts to the second star to the right. Yeah. <laughs> I'd like to, though. So it's almost yeah. like the NHS, right? The NHS costs money, but at the point of contact, it's free. So, like, we don't. <laughs> this is a pretty bad analogy. But... That is an analogy, yeah. <laughs> but... <laughs> so, so we, you know, like, like the cost is there. So, so the causal factors are there. But when we're experiencing it, and at the point that we're we're kind of like uh, engaging with it, with we we have free will. Yeah, in the sense that, yeah, if yeah. you're experiencing the, yeah, the thing. You're still well, if you start going for determinism, you start getting into, should somebody be punished for their crime? Yes. Well, yeah, that's, more yeah, than that's that. I mean, you could still say that, that the punishment should be there because you're trying to protect society and all of that. But what the big, big question is the impact on morality. Because, yeah. you know, yeah. if, if there is no real agency, is there really any morality if you have no actual choice if you could no way have done otherwise um you know you couldn't have cho chosen to do this thing then have you really acted immorally because morality at least the way it's generally understood takes into account agency and intent but if you have no agency then how are you actually morally accountable you think... could still have intent, but I would also probably say that morality is also si kind of something we just made up as a way to hold ourselves accountable and to, <laughs> to a standard because we live in a society. <laughs> but so like with without us to determine that morality is even a thing, kind of like money, money, we, we made it up. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I still think... think morality is important as well, though, because even in a deterministic Oh, universe... it doesn't mean by any means that it loses any value. It's still valuable. Just because we made something up doesn't mean it doesn't have yeah, that... any kind I think of it worth. Means ultimately, there is nothing that is actually immoral if there's no agency. Or moral. You're not doing anything no, good just, or bad. You're just following the path. I think, I think... I Daniel Dennett's view, isn't it, is that there, there's, there's the... I don't know what the other word he uses. I watched a video earlier that said it, but he said there's a dip diplomatic view of these things in that, like money, money is a right. thing that exists in in like the universe, but it it exists for us and it's worth something for us. So we have a diplomatic view of that thing. So free will would be included in that morality. You, what you could do is you base instead of basing morality on about whether or not what you determine is right or wrong. So if you go the Sam Harris route and go morality, the the good thing is what is going to do the ultimate good for yeah, everybody or good, the best yeah. you possibly can. You don't have to do it that way. You could change it to be like whatever is going to give you the best consequences. Because the best consequences aren't necessarily going to be what is the best good for everybody. And so, but the best good for everybody is also still the, the best consequences you could possibly get out of all possible consequences. Because with or without morality, there are still going to be consequences to your actions. So if you base morality off of consequences instead of based off of the individual's view of right or wrong, it changes it doesn't matter whether you have agency or not because you've done something that has negative consequences whether you decided to or not. Yeah, I think I think this is something that we talked about with, with Dave yesterday actually when we talked about uh, do you remember like the the impact on the term, from from the term, determinism to sort of like rationality as well. But yeah. you can't say that rationality is merely like a descriptive state like I, I'm describing a clock functions properly and so whether or not even if that clock is completely determined right you can you can um sort of um make a distinction between a clock that work functions properly which would be sort of like functions in accord with the rules of logic and all of that or it doesn't function properly so that would be a sort of a descriptive way to to talk about rationality and it could be a descriptive way to talk about sort of morality as well right because if you subscribe to consequentialism of some sort then you could still say oh this is wrong because it has negative consequences like there's nothing about determinism that changes that you can yes. be entirely selfish about your morality and still be like exist within society and say like listen i'm only going to do what's best for me but doing this yeah. negative towards thing towards somebody else is kind of come back and bite me in the ass 
so I don't want to do it. Yeah. So what what I mean by this, right? If we we to think about terms, uh, you know, if we have no agency, right? Like because we're basically these NPCs, right? A avalanche. I don't know if that's quite a quite equivalent, but okay. Well, no, but you 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 agreed that there were we had no. If we were NPCs, we're just following our programming. We're not actually making choices. You know, those choices are the choices we would always make. We wouldn't. There's no way we could choose either or. It would just. This is what we would always choose. That that was your position, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we think about an avalanche wiping out an entire village. That had no choice in the matter. There's no agency there either. Would we say the avalanche is immoral? Or would we just say the consequence was bad? Or are we going the T-jump route? Well, that's what I'm saying, though, because if we are no different to... If we, we're just following a deterministic path, we're really no different to an avalanche falling off or a rock falling on someone's head. I, I guess I think, I think um, the, the... No, don't worry. I still think that we, you know, that there has to be that accountability there within society, even if hard determinism is true, and you know, like we have to. Uh, that's why we've got legality, and you know, we should try and rehabilitate people or take people and and put them, uh, you know, in prison and and you know, punish if if necessary. Um, I tend towards going towards the rehabilitation route, but I know that that's not how most prison systems work. Um, and so I understand the need for this concept of morality anyway, but I'm just saying, ultimately, if we are NPCs, there is no difference in the moral judgment. We're just saying, no, that, that was a bad thing that happened. I think I, I, think I disagree with that in, in a sense that I, I think you can get away w uh, with this if you say something like, um, it, no, matter, no matter how you're going to judge things, right? it's not going to change for an avalanche. Right, like, and it's gonna it's gonna happen anyway, right? It's it's not like by you making a a sort of a declaration that this is immoral, it's gonna change uh, when when the avalanche comes down or the rock is falling, right? That's the difference because we, within we, with agents, right? We even even though everything is determined, we function off of you know what makes us feel good, what our desires are, and so of course, if you have this system of morality in place. You're creating sort of artificial sort of constraints that press down on you, so that you're less likely to do the things that are going to cause sort of bad outcomes. Right. No, and so, in that, that sense, in, in that sense, you know, it would still make sense to have a difference because, of course, you know, you, you don't really say that the avalanche was immoral because it doesn't make sense to that because it w would still happen anyway, and it wouldn't increase the probability of it happening. While you know, you, you, it does make sense to talk about it like that you made an immoral thing because that will decrease if, if everyone agrees with it and it, it's actually sort of uh, enforced that yeah. will decrease the probability of it happening. Yes, that's the that. thing. You're talking about the important part of it, and I think it's still important, and I would agree with you. I'm just saying the ultimate judgment on morality loses its meaning, its actual meaning, because you're, it's an NPC. And if you wanted to put in protections in place, you could put some ways to prevent avalanches in and, and all that sort of thing. But that's that's going off topic. I'd see in a deterministic way, right, if we're NPCs, morality becomes like downloadable content for a game that can change the way that NPCs process things. And give them different actions. Updates. Exactly. Goddamn Windows updates. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. And, and that's why it's still important, but it just means the judgment on morality isn't the same as we understand morality now. Because so, morality. Yeah, definitely. That, that, that changes drastically, of course. Yeah. Yeah, like, I would what I would, the way I would probably describe it is that just because our actions are determined doesn't mean we aren't. Human beings are determined creatures. We have things that we want and goals that we want to reach. Just because we don't get to choose that we ha are determined creatures and that we are creatures in the in this framework that we're in doesn't mean that we won't have those goals anyway. You have the goal to make society a better place or have a life that is good for you. You may not have been able to decide that that's the way you are, but that doesn't mean that you aren't that way. So you're going to you're predetermined to do whatever it is that makes society a better place in your sense because we are a social species. And so because that deter that that de being determined and that desire to move forward as a species is part of what is predetermined about us means that 
morality is just another part of that framework. It's just another factor in how we move forward as a species and how we move forward with that predetermined determination. Can I, can I, can I just going back a little bit to how I linked the determinism, determinism and consciousness things in my head. So with with animal sets thing, he says that um, the experience that we have is a is essentially a controlled hallucination. Mm -hmm. so, so our experience matches reality kind of as best as it can, but also has some of its preconceived concepts uh, engaging on that, and it it is essentially a controlled hallucination. Would it be appropriate then to to describe the determinism that we have as controlled determinism? In the sense that it's not just as simple as uh, like the avalanche falling, killing people, but we have the ability to make choices at a level. I I think that maybe the avalanche is just deceptively simple. It's not as simple as it seems when you just on its face. Avalanches, rocks fall, party dies, right? Well, what, how did the rocks get there? How did they get in the position? What history took place for those rocks to be in the position that they were when they fell? There's a whole bunch of factors. How many times it rained seven years ago determined the position those rocks were going to be in so that they did fall when they did. So in that sense, yeah, that avalanche falling was predetermined. So the same way, if you want to say, oh, this kid played video games and was bullied so they went on a shooting spree because actually there's a psychological issue that uh, deals that that they had anger issues and rage problems that's actually predetermined by their genetics from their parents and because their parents this that and the other thing you have have a huge number of factors but just because just like I can measure the rain and how many times it rains for that avalanche to take place and I can determine if I'm paying that much attention but we're not paying that much attention yeah, to people. I guess, I guess the difference as well is that, that we do have the ability to weigh up information and make decisions based yeah, on... Yeah, that's, that's what I was... Right? Yeah. Yeah. So, to, to, and that's, I guess what I mean by controlled determinism in the fact that we, we aren't just making decisions in a vacuum based on all these... Well, we all these things right. are, are, are leading to that decision, but we are weighing up the options and we're making an important right. decision regardless. And I guess that's the thing. In, in, in terms of utility... Free will is is absolutely the, the 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 kind of thought process we need to have. Listen, Despite I can't choose to just hold my period in. <laughs> it's a determining factor in my day to day life that I have no control over. I can't just hold it in. I can't just wait right. till tomorrow. Like it's just not how that works. It, yeah, yeah, and I there's. Obviously, things like I guess it's just about kind of weighing up the balance and, and going like you know if they for instance that kid that the like in in your example of somebody who shoots up a school or whatever they understand the the implications of that prior yes. to doing that action yep. they still make that decision therefore they are accountable regardless of if all of the things leading up to that point were determined yeah um, even if their decision itself was determined by those pre-existing variables and factors all these things happened to that person and so it led them to this decision they're still responsible for making that decision i guess i guess this goes back to what or, I said earlier instead of saying it's about the decision they're still responsible for the consequences so yeah. even if you don't want to say hey listen maybe they are like an avalanche maybe everything that happened to them in their life was out of their control and it was all predetermined it was all going to happen to them anyway so they had no other choice but to shoot up that school there are consequences to the fact that they shoot up that school and so we as human beings because they're an individual that took an action put that responsibility for the consequences of that action onto the individual and it goes back I, to what I said earlier. I think this was before recording. In that, you know, we can say reasons, but they don't. They don't act as excuses. So obviously, re people have reasons for behaving in a certain yeah. way. That doesn't excuse the behavior. Yeah, you can explain well, why you did something wrong, but that doesn't excuse you from doing it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I think I disagree with all of you on this one. Actually, like I think. I think the idea of, of determinism, if, if true, has and should have severe uh, implications on morality. Maybe not as 
as, as severe as some people like to think that it's all all the, all the same, but not uh, not not even not not like completely um, as some of you were saying that it's still like uh, the subject because I, I think that you know if that kid really did have no choice in the matter. Right, the, the, the whole concept in morality of blame and 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 sort of all, all of that goes away. It all fades away because he's not really responsible for what he had no control over. Like responsibility hinges on the idea that someone could uh, do something else than what he did, and if, if that goes away, then you cannot hold oh. him responsible in the same way. Although right. I will say, wait, just right. just a second. Like I will say that as I, as I stated before, like there is still a way to to justify. For example, you know, putting him in a prison or, yeah. or having some sort of punishment. And that justification comes not from like, oh, he did a bad thing, so he deserves to be punished, but from the idea that if you don't do that, then you remove a constraint that is going to affect yeah. the society, that is going to increase the probability of these things happening. But, I yeah, think maybe I was unclear when that. I meant when I said responsibility. When I say responsibility, I don't mean, oh, well, they should be punished and it's all their fault. No, what what I mean is that there have been consequences to the actions that you took. And what I think determinism ought to do is it cha it changes the way we look at morality and it changes the way we look at how we structure consequences to actions. So instead of villainizing people and instead of, of I mean, there are some people that still just ought to be outcast for the betterment of society. There are people that just yeah. have like they just cannot exist in the in the world that everybody else exists. Oh, I and, agree but that, if we yes. instead of villainizing those people, exactly. accept their human beings yeah. working within the framework that they have to work in, it, it removes this other ism that goes on when somebody does something like shoot up a school or somebody does something like fly planes into a tower. Right? They they acted within yeah. the constraints that they that they were given and there's no way they could have done anything yeah. different. So really now what, yeah, what do yeah. we do? And now you have an entirely different discussion about whether or not the, the prison system is even something that's even, is punishment even worthwhile in that case? Because it's, is it really going to prevent anything from anybody? I mean, even, in even some cases it does and some cases yeah, it doesn't. Okay, I think the only way you could justify it, so, sorry, go ahead. I just, <laughs> I don't want to say, even, even if free will were true, Prisons, uh, like, and I, I don't obviously mean libertarian free will, but punishment and prisons ha are not effective at reducing crime rates or anything. Right. What's 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 effective for reducing crime rate rates is uh, a, a kind of a balanced socioeconomic uh, environment and um, opportunities in life, essentially, um, and rehabilitation. Systems like villages, like uh, in, yeah, like, Sys systems that allow people who can't exist in if people can't like function in this society, if there's more than one kind of society that they can choose to live in, that might be a better place for them to be able to live. Like take for example, if you're short, if if you're short and everything is of average height, you have any idea how much hard how hard of a time I have cutting a stupid carrot on a counter, bruh. <laughs> Bruh. Like, and I'm not even, I'm not like classified in the disabled area of small, right? But if you take somebody who is and they have to exist in a world where every single house around them is not built in a way that makes their day to day life easy, and in fact, it goes out of their way to make it difficult, then is there a way that we can adjust society that makes life better for that person and the same thing goes with psychological states if you have people who suffer from like acute um like they get they get triggered by like too loud of sounds is it appropriate for them to be living in a big city probably not they're going to get triggered way more often way more easily because there's just so much sound pollution so if it, if people are living in a time of better understanding and less villainization and also more opportunity and economic status, as well as with the environment we live in with the internet, and we are able to create opportunities that way, that person might have the opportunity to move to a place that is far better for them. And then they will be able to live in, in a society in a way that's not going to be detrimental for them. And it's not going to cause them to shoot up a school. Win-win. 
Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I think it, it moves sort of like more to like when you imprison someone, it's more like I'm, I'm very, very sorry that you're in this situation where we're going to have to remove you from society because you right. could actually create some like. Right, yeah. Yeah. Yes. And on top of that, you know, you're creating again. Like this is actually the debate to be uh, had. Um, because Escape you said from that, New York. <laughs> you said that some, some, some prison systems are not as effective at reducing crime. And I think that is starts to become a very, very relevant issue at that point because like l a large chunk of the justification of you putting people in would be, I think, to actually create these constraints that uh, decrease the likelihood of something like this happening again for people that, you know, again, in, th in this sort of like weight uh, of desires, like this fight of desires, right? I, I want to do this, but maybe if there's this constraint that is, that is saying to me that if I'm going to do it, I'm going to end up in prison and something unpleasant is going to happen to me, then this wins over, so I'm not going to do that. And if you remove that, maybe I'm then more like, going to do that more like more often or something like that and so you want to have like a good balance but the conversation of that uh, uh, like turns to the idea of you know how can we construct sort of like a, a justice system or a prison system or anything that like punishes in in these very strategic places to reduce or to to still keep enough pressure in society to keep it functioning properly but but not like on, on this other hand where it's just yeah you have to be punished because it's something bad like this. yeah Rich, rich, yeah, I do, I do I think everybody really uncomfortable really quick? Due to the sensitive nature of the following conversation, we have decided not to publish on YouTube. We have uploaded an unedited copy to our Patreon page. How, how do you guys feel about historical crimes? In, in what sense? Yeah. Someone, someone committed a crime like, uh, say, 40 years ago. That's an arbitrary number, but it could be like 30, uh, 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 at least a generation ago. And it didn't get found out until the present day. And there's no reason to believe that there was any other criminal activity between, those, between that time and the present day. Uh, should they be uh, punished for that still? Or should they be rehabilitated for that still? What should be the outcome there? That's a tough one. I mean, Did I they think... rob a bank? Well, I think it, I personally it might depend on the crime for it, me. It so, like, if they, on the crime. And yeah, I if they rob like, a keep... bank, I'd be like, no, nah, fuck it. They got away with it. Let them have it. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I think it also depends how much harm was caused. And I also think, I actually think things should be about re rehabilitation. So if you're actually saying they've never done anything wrong since, right, then do they need to be rehabilitated? Well, so let's take the example of uh, that, uh, like, kind of, what was he? I think he was a Nazi general who obviously committed war crimes in World War II. The Nazi regime fell, and then he got tried when he was in his 70s, I think, or 80s. Uh, for, and he got, like, multiple life sentences for that. I but think he, there's, there's a line that will vary depending on the kind of crime in this case there it's likely that there are still a lot of people that benefited from the closure of yeah. removing like five they years off of this justice. guy's life and so the, the question is is at that point you would have to weigh the priority is the um, closure mm -hmm. and and mental state of this X number of people more important than the five years of this guy's life. He's almost dead anyway. Yeah, yeah. I think I think there's that aspect. There's also the aspect of you know, if if we let this one get away, it sort of, sort of sends this message that you know you can get away with it if you if, it, if it's long enough, you know, and then that might sort of incentivize certain things if that is the case. Um, sort of the, all these factors would need to be considered as well as the closure thing, right? Because it might actually be a benefit to some Restorative justice is generally going to be better than, than punishment justice. Yeah. I don't think removing five years off of that guy's life is really gonna, like, I mean, I guess it would suck as an old person being like, well, damn it, I guess I die in jail now. Fuck. But like, how, like, what is that compared to to these people who have x this x a number of people who what so let's I, i'm i'm gonna just speculate on ages here and say this guy is in his 70s but the person who's getting restorative justice is in their 30s or 40s mm -hmm. 
and is still oh. dealing with that trauma and the closure from from this person's because there's also a difference between standing trial and then the execution of whatever justice ends up being decided because sometimes it's the standing trial bit where they're confronted with all of their crimes that acts as the closure rather than whatever punishment comes after that trial so you might be able to do a little bit of column a and a little bit of column b so in which case you could then try the person make them stand there and listen and hear all the testimonies and and be confronted with what they've done by the people who they did it to and then decide that hey listen they're imprisoned in their house for the rest of their life like we're not gonna we're not gonna he's 70 fuck off he's gonna die in five years let him just be in his house <laughs> yeah in that situation uh his it, it probably, yeah, imprisonment yeah. isn't really going to be valuable but it might be valuable to say like listen we're also taking all of his assets when he dies and it's everything that he ever owned is going to be liquidated and donated to the people who he harmed in general or something yeah. and it's restorative at least i, I think it's a tough one I, I think it's one that i'd actually have to spend a lot more time Thinking for, on, for stuff is difficult like that <laughs> it, it really depends like and that's such like an extreme one if you were to make something that's maybe even a little bit more gray you could be like this person 70 years ago stole a gemstone that was really important to this family and so it's it's a item that has personal value and maybe only so much monetary value the person never stole again all they did was take one thing but it was something that was had a lot of sentimental and had been passed down so through this family emotional harm. right so what this guy's now 70 years old do you try him for this jewel well just just as a aside just thinking about the real world we know that uh, uh um the justice system uh gives preferential treatment to monetary value over personal value oh absolutely <laughs> so in that case the, what the justice system would do is go well no yeah yeah the justice system would be like who the fuck cares but i think most people would also be like like you already didn't have it for 70 years get over it <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like seeing see, see, this isn't going live, like Steve's situation, for instance. Yeah. The fact that it's, it's not going money. Ah. Oh, do it. Do it. Do it. Do it. Do it. The fact, the fact that it's so much money is what would be interesting to the core, not how much money that would, uh, how that would influence Steve's life, for instance. So even if it was like a few right. hundred dollars, and that that had a bigger influence on Steve's life than the tens of thousands, which is is uh, is obviously unlikely but um percentage wise they they would take the yeah. more seriously than, than the difference the between the, the so that's actually one of the things that you can tell how the court is biased against steve in this case because he's now had to live for two years with this hanging over his head as well as not being able to make any money and grow the channel for the last two years and that's been in kyle's favor the the, the Court has been incredibly more than fair to Kyle and uh, like to giving giving him time, get letting him get a lawyer, waiting a month or two before they'll even set a date for anything. Like it's absurd, but that's also part of the justice system. At least in in America, is set to be that the justice system is also supposed to protect the plaintiff from the defendant in this kind of case. And it hasn't been. So because it hasn't been, I think it's very likely that Kyle's going to end up being more fucked because they've given him everything and every opportunity and every chance. And so much time has passed that he's just going to get slammed super hard at the end of it, right? I think Because then you can talk about projected profits. Going back to, to the concept of redemption for a second, I think like there are these sort of thought experiments in philosophy where, where it's like someone did a bad thing, right? Then he had a stroke or something and he forgot what he did. You know, is he still responsible? Should he still be punished for what he did? Because like what what is basically the thing that makes him the same person if, if he completely forgot everything, right? And 
exactly the, cont the continuation of the identity. And I think even if that doesn't happen, right? Like, because I don't think memory is really a good um, sort of justification to distinguish between these two things. I think that there has to be something else involved here. So the question then becomes, in a sense, you know, what is the thing that makes it right for you to, to sort of punish someone after the thing has been committed? You know, what, what sort of justifies that? Is, he, is it merely the recollection of the event from the same person? Like, if he remembers that, then, then he should be punished. If he doesn't remember that, then he shouldn't be punished. What, what is the thing? Because that seems a bit absurd to me. I, I think justice is just made up anyway. We just yeah, made it up. Agree. It's just bullshit. We just made it the fuck up to make us feel well, better yeah. about ourselves. <laughs> well, I don't think it was even that. I, it was. It was. It was almost certainly uh, in. It was almost certainly created to punish people for transgressing against their uh, their head of superior whoever yeah. it was yeah, yeah. So, so we've got a situation where you've got like if you were to say that the justice even if somebody is forgotten the justice isn't actually about them the justice is about who they wronged it's not really about the individual if somebody shoots up a school the justice part of them being in jail forever isn't about them the justice part is about the families who lost whoever that's who's who's supposed to be getting recompense so if yeah. you want to talk about redemption the, th the issue with redemption is redemption sacrifices the person who was harmed right and uh the courts are just shit at justice anyway like, oh yeah also that yeah. You, do, you, do you pay for it? <laughs> the 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 way your prosecution occurs is if the police or the crown prosecution service decide that it's in the public's best interest to prosecute the case regardless of whether they think the event actually happened right so a le a le an illegal act could have occurred they know it occurred they they have enough evidence to uh support a conviction but is it in the public's best interest to convict if it's a no, it won't get convicted, regardless of the Well, law. sometimes if it's a no, the public won't even know about it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They just don't, they don't press charges. Crazy. Yep. So, <clears throat> I'm coming back to the, looping back into the, the free will bit. Because <laughs> 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 we've sort of gone really off piste, and, and in a good way. Um, Let's move on. What? So we're cutting back into this bit, right? Yeah. <laughs> this, this, this point for you. Oh, hey, uh, now that we've made everybody pretend. super duper uncomfortable and we've cut back into the talking about what we were originally talking about, <laughs> hi, never invite me anywhere. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think we've discussed sort of free will and, and determinism a lot. I think there's still a hell of a lot of conversation to be had. I think ultimately we're still in a position where we don't really know enough about everything to be a hundred percent certain one way or the other. Um, I think there's plenty of good arguments, um, especially for determinism. Um, I think it's fair to say that the, the universe is, you know, mostly deterministic with elements of randomness. And I'd say that people, are mostly deterministic with elements of randomness and it's i'm certain that there is no libertarian free will but and i'm a little bit more agnostic on my p p position than i was before um i still feel and it's a feeling so it's not fully rational but i still feel there is a sort of Compatible, compatibilist type of free will in there. Um, while I understand the uh, arguments for determinism. Um, and, yeah. I think the thing is, at the end of the day, is that you are never going to possibly know, so live the life that you want to live. And if that means yeah. changing something, then change something. If that means not changing something, despite pressures, don't and society may or may not accept you and that's not up to you <laughs> yeah. ultimately you still do what you want right like that, that, that if that's not the point of free will then, then i don't know what <laughs> is <laughs> so end of the day even if live the life true, you want to live doing because you're doing you it no matter what yeah, yeah. yeah it's, it's, it's whether, just whether we have deciding. 
some form want, of free will, will or we have as you as you said the experience of free will without any actual free will if you hate your life, it's because you had no other choice but to hate your life, and you're going to hate your life no matter what. But also, that's your own fault, but not your fault in any way, shape, or form. Also, yes, but also no. Have the ability to now recognize that, and, and sort of, you know, there might be something else that is kicking in that is not going to make you hate your life anymore because now you realize that. That might be another part. Maybe you can set a new domino track on the road. By just realizing that actually, even though it is deterministic, or if it is, or if it isn't, but if it is deterministic, you can still use this point as a causal factor to determine a new path for yourself. <laughs> it, well, what it means is that just because you think this is where your future is going to go, you can't possibly know the factors. So do what you want to do for the outcome that you want. And in doing so... <laughs> You're going to end up determined wherever you were going to be anyway, so fuck it. <laughs> and just enjoy yourself. You're just along for the ride, man. Uh, yeah. So, or are you? Yeah, well, who knows? <laughs> like, what people don't realize, I think, about determinism is that ultimately, like, even as I said before, right, like, you're still doing what you want. So it's not like you're. you're it's that type where, where you cannot do something, right? You're still doing what you want. It just ha so happens you, boo -boo. what you want is, is determined. So it's not going to change, but <laughs> you're still doing that. So I don't, think, I don't know if it's as bad as some people think like at the beginning. Yeah. I think yeah. there's like a really nihilistic way you could look at it and oh, a really yeah, sure. positive way you could look at it. You could either look at it as nothing matters, nothing I do ever matters, da 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 da, -da. But that's not necessarily the case. You can also look at it as like, well, if it's all determined anyway, I may as well do whatever it is that I want to do, positive or negative, in whatever aspect, because I already decided this, me deci making this decision was already predetermined and it's going to happen anyway, so. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I do feel understand you have to take why either control a black hole conversation. Except, really. that, except that you control nothing and therefore control everything. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry about... <laughs> sorry, you're sorry about what? Sorry, you cut out there. Uh, I'm a Buddha. It's because of Chesh again. <laughs> <He's coming>. uh, <laughs> I'm sorry that I, I, I wanted to have this black hole conversation, but, but I've learned a lot. I've learned so much. And you uh, had no sorry, choice in the matter anyway. Well, now I believe that, yeah. <laughs> Just remember, <laughs> there is no spoon. In, in, in understanding that you have no control over anything, you have control over everything. <laughs> that's, Zen. That's an oxymoron. <laughs> <laughs> now, there it, is, there is, is no... Thinking, man. <laughs> that's like, what is that's the... Like, Fresh frozen peas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they were fresh nothing they were happens. Frozen. Nothing happens for a reason. Everything is absolute chaos. It's just predetermined chaos, and we just don't know any better. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's been a really interesting conversation, and thank you for for joining us, and also Dave, who's disappeared. Um, yeah, it was. It's really good. It's still one of those things where I'm. I'm still still undecided i am as i said i'm becoming a little bit more agnostic about my position and shifting more towards the determinism side of things again um you have no choice a couple of years ago in. And yeah I, I know i know but it's it's the more i think about this every time i think about this topic i end up in a different position to where i was before because like oh but i haven't thought about this thing and i sit here and i go through all of it and I go oh right right yeah um <laughs> Ultimately, I feel, I feel like your brain, when you get to the end of one of these conversations, just you just look like you just dropped an egg on the floor. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I definitely need to sleep on it again for another couple of days and let my, my brain do its thing and tell me what my decision is. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, so thank you very much. Uh, you've been listening to the Fresh Air Sci Fi Show. I'm Joe. I'm Bid Theretic. I'm Chesh. And I'm Philip.
And I'm not Dave, but I'm going to say goodbye for him anyway. <laughs> Good night, all. <laughs> Dave's not here! Oh. <laughs> <laughs>